and AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Welcome to XY Live. Uh, we've got Chris Ridd today. Uh, he's the ex-CEO of Zero and uh, the current CEO of My Prosperity. Today we're going to be covering how to get your business humming. And uh, there's, there's a quite, a, quite a broad range of topics we're, we're going to be covering on. And uh, I guess Chris, Chris has Chris is, uh, managed businesses that have grown from small things to big things. So is, there's going to be a lot in there that uh, smaller practices can relate to. And I guess the I really like to see also a lot of things that um, I guess people in employed practices, for them to understand the challenges of running a business, I think there's going to be some really good takeouts there as well. So Chris, uh, welcome to, to XY Live. Good to have you on board. Great to be here, Adrian. Thank you for having me. So um, I guess a lot of the time when we, when we start out, um, Chris, Chris is known sort of for um, being in the media in the past quite a bit. Maybe a lot of the advisors don't know. He's, uh, he's quite a vocal spirit in the accounting world and uh, he's, he's left uh, quite an impression on it with his um, tenure at zero. But um, today we're going to learn about um, what, what he did there. And um, Chris, can you tell us a bit about, um, I guess, your journey? Yeah, sure. Hey, and who would have thought accounting would have been so exciting? Like, you know, you talk about being a vocal person in, in, in accounting and how exciting the industry was. <clears throat> when I came into Xero, um, I didn't know what to expect, to be quite honest. But with my background, uh, 28 years now, um, most of that in technology and actually uh, the bulk of that in large multinational companies. So I spent 15 years at Microsoft, um, which was, um, you know, I started there in the mid 90s when they were really coming to the fore with the whole new technology. They were actually a disruptor in a lot of the sort of range unique mainframe systems. So um, obviously a, 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 an amazing journey with Microsoft. And then I joined, uh, I left there in 2010 and joined Zero. Um, I had a, I guess from my career standpoint, I was really excited about getting out of a big corporate and something a little bit more small and innovative and uh, so I joined Zero at, in 2010 and it was, um, you know, it was quite a ride for me taking that from six staff, I think about three and a half thousand customers at the time uh, up to when I left in early 2016 to so about 270 staff to over 300,000 customers so it was a pretty spectacular ride and a lot of lessons, a lot of fun and a lot of mistakes along the way um, and now here I am at my prosperity. I sort of have this um, passion for startups and tech so, um, sort of reliving some of those early early days. Well, well, talking on behalf of the audience, I think there's probably still a few people out there that are, are really probably challenging uh, accounting being cool. And uh, <laughs> but yeah. the um, but I tell you what, the uh, that that expertise is great with what you're you're doing in your new role. I'm sure. Well, I hope so. I mean, it is. It, it is funny coming uh, having seen zero go to this. Um, what is now. Uh, a bit of a juggernaut, like it's become um, this quite large organisation. I, I think 350 staff or something now in Australia, maybe more, um, over half a million customers. So it, it's been an amazing ride. Um, and yeah, look, it was a bit of a, a, bit of a change, a, a very pleasant change to come into something small again. But equally, like a lot of your viewers, um, starting out, um, you know, that first year, for me anyway, I mean, my prosperity has been going now since 2011. Um, launched in 2014, so I guess you'd say I'm a bit of a ring in. But um, but for me, that that first six to 12 months, there's always challenges, and when you're starting something and figuring things out, I mean, it, it is the, that's the fun part, mostly, <laughs> not always. Um, but but it is those formative years can be, uh, you can learn so much, and, and I'm I'm still learning, and that's what I really enjoy about this. Yeah, awesome. Well, the, well, what we're going to be covering today is, I guess. Three broad areas. So we're going to unpack, I guess, the importance of uh, the good, a good process and technology uh, in, in running uh, businesses, especially in the early days. And, and I guess it carries through to when it's a 300 plus people business as well. Uh, getting the right people around you and, and what you're doing in your business and making sure they're in the right roles. And then also balancing the time between generating new business 
delivering the committed clients and I guess service and product innovation because I think that's a big challenge for advisors in terms of they're on on the treadmill um, dealing with existing clients, dealing with compliance, but a lot of them really struggle to um, to develop new propositions for clients and, and just get stuck with the same same thing because it's working. And uh, yeah, how, how do you create that time to, to do things? So yeah, if we can probably start out with um, the the process side of things. Like you're in this you're in this small business like zero, for example, early days. What are what are some of the things like you're walking in and you you're going, how do we put this all together? What what's everyone doing? Is that the sort of questions you're asking yourself? Yeah, look, I think stepping back from it, the, the, sort of the non-negotiable for me, non-negotiable part of it is from day one, I think what you've got to do in any business is ensure that there's really good communication. Uh, and that is, you know, both as a leader talking about where you're going as a business, sharing that vision and, and making sure that you know, there's this regular rhythm of people communicating what's going on in the business. Because quite often the challenge with new businesses and startups is you're running a million miles an hour and you kind of assume that everyone knows what's going on. So I think I think that's that's the first bit. You know, you talk process. I, I, I kind of see that as really the fundamental in getting a business started, which is making sure there's great communication. And that's, you know, all the stuff that's going on, it's a good thing, the challenges, the bad things, and people really appreciate that. And that's about building a really open and transparent culture. Um, when, it, when it comes to process, that's probably the area that, um, you know, if, I, if I'm honest, where I am right now with my prosperity, we've got a great product, we've got traction in the market, there's a lot of good things happening. And I think where we're trying to really focus at the moment on this notion of, of processes really bedding things down so that we're really efficient. Um, so a big focus of mine has been making sure that we've got um, really good systems in place so that we can everything batch for the system So Chris, your, your internet connection is just uh, dropped up a little uh, bit. still uh, on. You there, Chris? How are we going? We're just having some technical difficulties, everyone. Anyone that's listening live, feel free to drop some questions in. Um, I know there's been uh, plenty of uh, questions around my prosperity in the group. Um, some of the more product focused questions we might save until the end, but the um, anything along these topics in terms of uh, tips and tricks that you might want to learn from uh, what Chris is, from Chris's experience, like he's he's been managing he's been managing teams um, for plenty of years, and also I guess the technology side of what he's been doing. So um, that Microsoft background is. Um, you can go toe to toe with anyone on uh, on tech questions, so um, feel free to get as techy as you want um, if they if, you, if you'd like. Um, while we're waiting for Chris to just jump back on, um, anyone that hasn't uh, heard about the the latest event that's coming up in November, uh, just check out the Facebook group. It's it's up there on the banner. There's a you'll be able to find the link in the group. Uh, it's all about fintechs, um, and we're having a bit of a startup uh, themed event. Uh, a lot of the tickets, I think we're almost over halfway already and it's only been a few days that the tickets have been available. So get get in there because uh, yeah, you don't want to miss out. And uh, I guess a, a couple of other things are that um, we've had we've had um, we've had some really good um, uh, I guess numbers coming through um, in terms of people sharing in the in the group. We're just over 1,200 people in the Facebook group, and uh, I don't know what's going on, but um, there's been some, uh, there's been a real spike in um, awesome sharing. Chris, hello, he's back. <clears throat> oh, the irony my of uh, my computer decided. <laughs> the irony of the tech, the tech my CEO, works. <laughs> dropping offline. <laughs> Yeah, could you please put everyone out of their misery, well, Chris, anyway. because they've had to listen to me ramble for a bit. Um, <laughs> I think we're in the middle of um, the process side of things. So I think... Yeah, look, I, guess, I think, I think that's, that's, that's where we are at the moment, um, figuring out all our systems as well as network connectivity, uh, <laughs> all those good things. But, I mean, you know, seriously, it is about making sure you've got 
great tech and figuring out, you know, how do you get your processes in a state, you know, things are, w are working really efficiently. And that can really take some time because ultimately you've got limited resource and you want to make sure that you start to move the business towards automation and Okay, great question, Troyden. Um, can my prosperity integrate to XPlan? We'll save that one um, for, for a bit later on. We'll keep that on the... How's it going there, Chris? How's that? Yeah, you, yeah you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. So look, I think where we got to was our systems, uh, processes, and obviously some of the tech. Um, you know, we're, we're in, the, in the process of really uh, mapping all that out at the moment. <clears throat> yeah, so Shane, Shane's actually jumped in with a question around um, with the to drive business efficiencies uh, and will technology, implement technology in your business, where would you start and what would you focus on? Well, for me, it was all around um, CRM, to be honest. I mean, I think making sure that we've got a really good CRM system where we can track and manage partners um, and ensure that that's really uh, bedded down is probably where we wanted to start. Um, anything to do with sort of the metrics as well, making sure that we've got really good business measurements so that we can see what's happening in the business was also really important to us. So they're probably the two areas that we really wanted to focus on. Um, we've got a pretty, given that we're a product and tech company, we wanted to make sure as well that we've got good systems around um, how we um, build products. So probably not as relevant for your, your viewers here, but um, things like uh, Jira and Confluence we're actually planning what we're doing around technology and how we're building products is also focus. Yeah, okay. So, and in terms of, um, I guess, the way that you visualise processes, because, like, advice businesses obviously have the, the centralised um, uh, back-end process in terms of developing, doing the research, developing the advice document. What about sort of, is this, is this stretching from the front end? Are you mapping everything from first touch point with a client all the way through to... Um, ongoing after sales service, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've we've been doing a lot of systems mapping to work out what are the, you know, the optimal process right from the, the get go. You know, from, um, you know, in our case, we get a lot of inbound inquiries. <clears throat> so as they come into the funnel, how we're actually managing and nurturing our communication with prospects through to demonstrating to them to obviously signing them up as a partner and then there's a whole lot of work we're doing at the moment to really optimize the steps because there's a bit of work involved when a when an advisor or an accountant rolls out our technology we want to make sure they're helping them every step of the way so it's really about documenting down to the very nitty-gritty detail exactly what we do through that process so that it's a great experience so all of this comes down to how do we create the best possible experience for our partners so they get to the end of the journey and they're really successful with our technology that to us is really really important so at the moment we're probably not where we want to be but we're certainly on that journey and then this process mapping um, obviously like at each step of the process there's things that need to be done um, and there's a way that um, you'd like to see them done is there a way a certain way that you document um, these processes do you use videos or anything or is it generally just a well-documented word document or how do, you, how do you do that? Well, internally, we use Confluence, which is an Atlassian product which our developers use. And that's a great system whereby if you've got um, internal processes or anything, that doesn't change too dramatically. Um, you know, it's good to have those documented and really clear and any assets or emails or other templates and things that need to be placed on that process, it's all there. So as we get new staff in, it's great to be able to point them to that and say, look, there's a process, it's all documented. All the elements and the templates that you need to use for that process are there as well. So, um, you know, when it comes to our partners, though, I think, you know, pointing them to a confluence document, you know, with a whole other process is probably not going to really cut it. You've got to create that really good experience. So there's... We use a lot of video to really help partners understand how to roll out. You know, for example, we've got document signing platform. How do you use that? How do you sign up clients onto the platform? Having really engaging videos that really show how that works is important. Um, so, you know, and that's um, 
that, that's just, again, about creating great experience. One of the things that we're also looking to roll out that we in our product is uh, in-app notifications for top of the partners of the process. And, uh, and, and it's some really great technology that a lot of um, software as a service providers uh, are now building into their products. Just, again, whatever you're doing, whether you're a financial advisor or a tech company like us, you've really got to set the customer or partner through a journey and really help engage them so that they, they feel like they've been found help through that process and at the other end, you, know, you, you make them successful. Yeah, I completely agree. I think um, the way good SaaS or software as a service companies are looking at their business, uh, I think that's the way advisors or service businesses should really be looking at them. So video, um, up-to-date communication with, through various formats throughout the advice process. With the videos, is there anything that, like if someone hasn't got any videos, is there a particular area of the, um, the client experience that you'd suggest that um, they'd look at first and maybe how to go about it? Well, there's a lot of really good video platforms out there now that, that you can use um, and video channels, whether it be Vimeo or whether it be YouTube. Um, some of the products out there like uh, Wistia and the other ones we use, we use a couple, but we've, we've made a bit of investment in video. So for example, um, I'm seeing more and more, I've actually seen some of the really good advisors now uh, are using video themselves and have like the podcasts or interviews or video um, communication because re video really is the future when it comes to communicating uh, with your clients. Uh, it's so easy to do now. And my suggestion to anyone doing this is you know, go and investigate it because it doesn't take a lot. You know, I even did one the other week with a financial advisor and <clears throat> he wanted to interview me on a you know, stuff. And I went into his office and you know, he was just using a, 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 an iPhone with a, I think it was a $15 movie kind of application, I forgot the name of it, I it up because I think I downloaded it. And um, he just had this little um, frame that he sat his mobile phone in. It, the the application is called Pro Movie. It's very cool. And it just sat there and we did the interview. Sound quality, everything was great. Posted it up online. Very, very cost effective, cheap production, but quality very good. So, we're very lucky now with the tech we've got. We should be able to produce really engaging, high quality video at a fraction of the cost that would have been in maybe five, ten years ago. Yeah, I presume you guys don't use your laptop for the video production, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of, um, I guess, some of the stuff that um, you've sort of like in get, getting this process along with the team, I guess. Because when you're coming into, um, you've come into a new team now, a lot of advisors um, have their existing team. Uh, is there any what recommendations around executing on um, rolling out a process and how to make sure everyone's on board with it? And because you, people are used to doing things the way they're used to doing it. Um, is there any suggestions yeah. in that space or experiences? Yeah, yeah definitely. I think, um, I, th I think that, you know, with any change, um, you've got to bring people on the journey. Um, and people need to know where you're going. You know, why are you actually implementing a process? If they can, if they can buy into that vision, that success, then you've got every chance it's going to work. And I think um, so. As part of that, I think what you want to do when you're looking at a team of people, typically someone will emerge as a champion, someone that the other team will look towards as a bit of a beacon or a signal that yeah, the person's brought in. You know, I'm ready to take on that journey. Because it can be hard sometimes when you're trying to implement change. There's a lot of resistance. So you've got to find those people that you can rely on as champions that are going to actually um, uh, adopt that change and, and be part of that cause. Um, and I think it's, you know, again, it's about communication and, and celebrating the quick wins. Whenever you're implementing something new, there's going to be teething problems and challenges. So what you want to do is handhold through some of that process and celebrate when things work. You know, if you've got a new thing that you're rolling out and it works <laughs> and everyone's excited, you know, sharing that success to make sure people say, you know, Okay, so we've got an example here of where we've rolled out a new process and things are going really well. Let's keep going. So, look, it's just some of those basics around change management, I think, that are really key. In terms of, um, like, selecting uh, who does what, is there a process you go around, maybe um, any profiling of um, people in the team or is that sort of an assessment process you might go through or...? Yeah, look, I think so. I mean, um, quite often um, when, you know, managers come into an organisation, um, you know, they don't necessarily know that uh, a 
across their team, they may have people with hidden skills. I'll give you a really good example. We've got a guy here, Mark, who, when I joined, he was our, um, one of our ma main trainers. So he's got an accounting background uh, and, uh, and really understands counting and uh, you know, the, the product. So very, very good at it. Um, but recently I moved him into a new role, which was overseeing all of our business systems because what I realized uh, as we got into it that you know, for an accountant, he's actually really good on, on systems and he really understands what we're trying to do. Um, and he's passionate about it. And um, so I needed someone to oversee all our systems. And we've got a number, probably about 10 or 12 kind of core systems right across the business um, from CRM through to you know, Power BI for our dashboard and a whole lot of other stuff. Um, and, um, but I didn't want to get someone super techie. I wanted someone who would actually look at it from the point of we trying to achieve the business. And I found Mark you know, had that skill set. So he's now in that role and it's going very well. So that's just one example. Well, that's, that's a good segue, I guess, into the, the people side of things. Uh, like you've, um, you've had a huge experience in small teams and, and big teams. And we've just uh, lost you again, Chris. <laughs> Can you hear me, Chris? Nice question, by the way, Shane. Uh, keep them coming. Um, it's, a, it's a really good space to unpack the um, overlap between accountants um, and, and bookkeepers and, and uh, how, how planners can, can work with them. Um, well, I've, I've been doing quite a bit of work around looking at the balance between sort of what, how an advisor practice fits into an accountant firm. And it's just, I think there's just so much upside in this space. It's just about making those connections. I am. Wish I'll persist. I've got, uh, I've tried different options, but um, we keep dropping out. I'm, I'm, my apologies. That's all right. Let's keep yeah. Going. yeah. So, so we're just rolling into the, the people side of things. And yeah. um, like, obviously, when you're building, especially around startups, I think, like established businesses, even if it's a smaller advice business, um, established businesses, uh, oh, sorry, startup businesses, it's, crucial like the people build the business essentially like you can have a great idea but if you don't have the right people helping you execute this dream it's not going to work so what are what are the things you look for that really help drive your um, i guess your role in terms of what you need to deliver and your business objectives what what are, what are the things that you suggest people are looking for well i think it starts with understanding what, what what your purpose is as a business. I mean, I know this is getting decked back to some very high level stuff, but if, you, if you're very clear on the purpose and some of the values you expect people to exhibit in delivering on that purpose, it makes hiring a lot easier because you're looking for people that really share in the same vision and values that you want to I think that's really important from day one. Um, and I know, look, I got that wrong um, in the early days at Zero. There was both, um, probably some existing staff, but also people that I, I remember one particular hire early on that, that really wasn't a good fit. And I thought, well, that's fine because they're in a support role. They're not going to cause much problem. But, you know, it doesn't matter what role it is within the business. People, you know, whether it's a person at the front desk or on a support, in a support role or whether it's a CEO or someone on the leadership team, um, you really got to make sure that the people coming in buy into the vision, buy into the purpose of which you exist and also, in, you know, uh, uh, really live the values because, you know, life's short. You want to have a business that really hums and the people get along and people really enjoy and have fun working there. And I don't think you can afford to bring in people that aren't really going to buy into that because it does cause problems. It does actually impact culture. And ultimately, you know, we spend so much time at work. You want to make sure you're working in a culture that people buy in and get along and, and love working there. So, you know. so, so how do you, how do you, is there ways that you might go about that? Is it just taking them down to the pub with the, the existing team and see if everyone gets along? Well, look, I used to, um, I used to be quite particular about the hiring process and I, you know, it might seem odd, but, you know, I hired 270, roughly 270 people at zero. I interviewed probably about 99% of them. Um, and the reason I did that was, you know, I, I had a very simple, uh, it wasn't a particularly complex set of questions, but I would always be looking at, um, you know, what people, um, uh, you know, the particular questions that really fleshed out what made that person tick and, um, and it was a really good, it was a good process for me because it meant that I had a finger on the pulse of who was coming into the business. But I think it also demonstrated that, you know, a lot of people coming into a business, doesn't matter how small, the CEO doesn't always interview. And I'm not saying that everyone should do this, but I think demonstrating that the CEO actually really cares about who's coming through the door 
and who's on the payroll and who's actually, you know, coming into your business um, is a good, good message to send. So for me, it was just really about making sure that I felt comfortable that people coming in, you know, live the values or you know, were a good cultural fit. I, I rarely said no, but there were occasions I did. Um, and, and one of two things would happen. Either um, my manager would go, yeah, fair enough, it's a good point. Um, I, I didn't see that. Or they would challenge me and we'd have a conversation about why I felt I didn't, wasn't comfortable with the individual. And it drove a conversation about, okay, well, you know, I didn't see that. This is what I saw. And, you know, I'd usually roll over and let them have their way. <laughs> but it was, just, it was just a really good conversation to, to have about, you know, um, ensuring that we've got, you know, a high bar in terms of what we're trying to build around culture. Um, beyond that, I think you can do some analysis around, um, you know, people's behaviour and other thinking styles. And what you want to make sure is that you get a good mix. You know, you don't want to hire people of the same sort of style or cultural background or, you know, um, you know work experience. And, you know, the, 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 the important thing, I think, in any culture is that you're hiring, certainly based on a particular um, set of values, but, but certainly you want to have a very diverse culture. And I think that's where you get the best outcomes for a business. Yeah, I think one of the challenges, like I've, I've been across practices hiring uh, quite a bit, and one of the challenges is that people um, will have to look, if you're looking for someone that you're going to enjoy um, time with, and that's all you're focusing on, and, and they, you want someone that's similar to you, it's often not going to work in a small business because the reason why you need other people is because it's, um, you need complementary um, skill sets. So I, I guess, um, yeah, it's the challenge of making sure that the um, people are matching the job description, but also sufficiently, I guess, uh, matching the culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's about getting the right people with the right experience and skill sets to perform the job, but making sure that they're going to fit in with the culture um, because it stands out if you get the wrong people in, um, you know it's uh, it's going to hurt you in the long run well this is a, actually I've got a bit of a question from my side of things in terms of job descriptions because mm -hmm. I guess especially with a startup business and even with advice businesses you, you, you you've got this vision of what you think this role will look like and and what's going to be covered but you don't you don't fully know what the capabilities of people, of people are and often from a business standpoint, if you've got a resource in your business that's capable of doing different things and maybe working a bit outside what that initial scope was, you probably want them to, to be able to do it. But how do, you, how do you manage that? Is that something that you preposition when they're coming on board or um, is this just, how do, you, how do you communicate and manage those expectations if you suddenly <coughs> see that there's a better or a, another channel that they can, um, they're better used for the business's sake? Yeah, look, I think, um, I think it's a case of um, uh, clear expectations, KPIs, position description, you know, right up front. I mean, it's, it's quite common with startups that people come in and there's a particular role and there's nothing wrong with creating a role and then finding that you need to sort of uh, change and alter that as you go forward. You know, um, I think most startups would have a particular structure and uh, process in mind and as they go through, they realise that there's skill gaps or they've got a role that's not quite delivering where they want it to. So you've got to be somewhat flexible, but uh, the more you can actually set expectations by having a clear set of deliverables um, and outcomes and KPIs right up front, I think, you know, that's, that's really important. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> yeah, it's my turn to have a couple of tech, uh, tech mishaps. <laughs> the, um, on the KPIs, the, You've got a range of different people that do different roles in your businesses that you work with. Um, and you've got like, arguably uh, the front end, which is a sales focused role there. You'd think they're a bit easier to sort of set the KPIs for linking, linking them to the business's objectives. But what about the internal team and how do you, how do you um, look at rewarding them and um, incentivizing them? Yeah, look, I think um, it's a really good question because quite often you've got a lot of, um, or you have administration stuff that aren't necessarily tied to KPIs or um, sales outcomes where there's commissions or other things like that. And I think as much as possible, again, I think it's about making sure that they're bought into the vision that you're trying to create. Because I think ultimately, you know, teams working together and, and being able to um, uh, deliver as a team on, on, on outcomes, you know, is... You know, people aren't always driven by money. Money is not always the motivator. It's about making sure that you've got, you know, uh, really good outcomes that people can share in the success. So, 
you've got to make sure that other staff that are in support roles are really bought into that and that they're excited about delivering a result. You know, you're not necessarily going to have everyone on commission and so forth, but it's about making sure that they're, you know, they're really sharing in the success. And is that by identifying, um, I guess, more unique or different types of KPIs within uh, people's roles? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, I think it's about making sure that you've got, you know, um, as, as much as, as well as KPIs, it's making sure that you're really clear on the interaction between different roles and departments so that there's, you know, clear ownership and handover on, on, those, uh, on those, those outcomes. Nice one. The, I guess um, we've got, we've got, I guess, uh, a couple of questions have come through. Um, Shane, so we might interplay, just jump into Shane Hayes' question around, uh, it's, it's a good one. It's, it's the whole interplay between accountants and advisors. And it's, it's a really, I guess, arguably a frontier that's um, yet to be cracked when you consider how many accountants are out there and how many advisors have relationships with accountants. Um, and, and deep relationships where um, the accountants are working, well, a lot of the accountants' uh, client base are working with the financial advisor. We've got a situation where uh, licensing has, like accountants can no longer do things that they did previously without either being self-licensed, limited licensed, or um, having, a, having a partnership with the, an advisor. What are, what are some of your, I guess, your suggestions around planners approaching this space and making connections? Yeah. So, well, I think, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, I think there's been a lot of talk about consolidation in the industry, um, accountants merging, or, you know, financial planners buying accounting practices, um, you know, um, accountants getting AFSLs, um, you know, and we're going to see more and more of that. So I think, I think, you know, I think the consolidation is happening because ultimately you've got to look at what's, what's, what's really driving a lot of that. And that is that I think that more and more having a, a, for a client having an advisor that one person to go to for all of your finances becoming much, much more uh, attractive. For, for, you know, I look at my own situation and having one advisor that can do all my accounting, but also a financial plan that can help me with a lot of decision making around my finances. Um, you know, so I think a lot of this has been driven by the market about clients wanting to have, you know, a, an advisor that can, that can look at their whole of wealth. Um, and of course, that's, um, you know, that's what's really driving this, this kind of collaboration between the two and the fact that, you know, there's also some other commercial outcomes where you've got advisors that are wanting to get into the accounting space because there's a lot of data that they can get on clients around, you know, tax returns and other things where, you know, I think financial planners generally are able to monetize that far more effectively than accountant. Um, so, so we'll continue to see a lot of those those trends, um, can, you know, emerge. Yeah, it's definitely, um, particularly in business valuations, there's such a big discrepancy about um, how much a client is worth in advice versus accounting. It's um, it's it's quite a large, with the accounting firms being worth between half and one times revenue, and um, advice firms going from two and a half all the way to four times revenue. So uh, yeah. It's definitely uh, it's a good move, Shane. I, I keep on looking at it, but it's, it's not necessarily an easy move, that's all. <laughs> so, Chris, with, um, with I guess, the, the priorities that you've got with these businesses that you've been running, how have you managed, um, especially now, now is probably one of the best, like it, you can probably think back to when the early days of zero, but balancing your time between looking at the front end and, and that business development piece and then making sure the product's still developing um, and the service of existing clients has been delivered. Is there, is there thing, tips around how you, or what, what are the challenges that, that happen in that space? Because I think a lot of advisors can relate to that. Oh, look, it's, uh, look I don't necessarily have the, the perfect answer there um, because what happens is that um, you want to try and get that balance right. But of course, you know, there's times where big opportunities come up and you've got to sort of throw yourself in there. And then there's other times that things at the back end break and you've got to throw yourself in there as well. Um, you know, so, um, so, you know, for example, if I look at us right now, we've, we've, we're on a bit of a, a growth trajectory. Uh, you know, things are happening very rapidly in terms of our growth in the market. And that's exposing some back end things that we, we want to get to. Equally, um, we've got partners that are rolling out our product and they're coming back to saying, hey, this could work better or we'd love to see this feature or, you know, so we've got to, we've got to balance innovation on a product with, um, with fixing some of the, um, perhaps some of the boring things. I mean, I know in the zero days that, 
in the first year that I was running zero, we didn't have payroll, we didn't have a whole lot of stuff in there. And, you know, we had partners buying into the vision because, you know, zero was quite innovative and no one was really doing cloud. Um, yet we had a lot of sort of the boring stuff that we needed to get to to make sure we could deliver on, you know, the important stuff. So, you know, I don't have the, 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 you know, the playbook for getting the balance right, apart from the fact that you do have to juggle a lot of balls and sometimes you are going to drop some and other times you're just going to have to really focus on one thing. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's, um, there's no, there's no magic in that. It's just, uh, it's just a matter of... You say, you say it's concept. more of an art than a science, Chris? I'd, I'd definitely say it's an art. I mean, there's, there's tools that can help you with, with balancing that. Um, you know, I use, I use a product called Trello, which um, allows me to look at different priorities in the business and, uh, and then being able to prioritise that. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, it helps you, you know, make sure that you're not putting all of your attention into to one thing. So visually you can actually see, okay, do I have a, a good, you know, blend across a lot of the functions of the business? Um, but, but ultimately, when you're in startup mode, if you don't have all the resources to manage all of that stuff for you, um, your time is going to be spent sort of jumping around at different things, and that's just the reality of running running a business. Would you say that, like, because there's been quite a bit of time difference between when you the last startup that you worked with and, and now in terms of the other one grew into a big business, so um, no longer class size classified as a startup, is there quite a big difference in terms of the tools that you've got available to you now? Can you feel the difference in, does that make it easier having all these tech tools? Or is this te all these tech tools that we've got available, is it just like, oh, we think it might be easier because we're using them or is it just the same stuff? It's just we're doing it a different way. Oh, look, I think there's, um, I, I think it's a lot easier now to run a business than say five, 10 years ago. Um, you know, you've got, um, so I'm just adjusting a few things here. Um, the challenge, um, the challenge you've got, you know, five, 10 years ago, was really expensive to do tech. You know, you had to, you had to have, you know, your own systems and service and so forth. And, um, you know, the reality is now is that you've just got a lot of great tools available that are a fraction of the cost that you can basically, you can, um, sign up for, um, you know, under a subscription, try it. If it doesn't work, you can try something else. Uh, you know, there's a lot of flexibility now, so it's definitely a lot easier. Uh, the challenge then is, um, because you're not start for choice, it's, it's a matter of not sort of over-engineering things and having too much stuff that you can't manage. Um, there's a temptation. There's a temptation to say, yeah, we need this, we need new CRM, we need you know, a new reporting tool, you know, we're going to roll out Zoom, we've got Calendly, you've got all these things, you know, plugging them together. Um, and you can sort of drown under the weight of trying to do too much. So I think it's a matter of making sure that you selectively look at the things that you want to automate uh, and then go about it in a fairly structured way. Uh, but certainly I... I've really enjoyed coming into my prosperity where, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had some systems, but not a lot. And we've spent a lot of time rolling out a new CRM. Uh, we've got a great HR system in place now. Um, we didn't really have a lot of visibility on numbers and stuff coming through. It was, um, you know, we had some spreadsheets that we're pulling out of the back end system. We've got a really great front end dashboard reporting tool that the sales guys know on a day to day basis where they're at. Um, We've been picking off a number of those things and things just feel a lot more in control. And I think that's really important. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd much rather run a business these days than I would have say maybe five, 10 years ago. It was just way too hard and way too expensive. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Would you, would you say that, um, like when you're going through these processes to decide, like, or like the thought process, what, what are you thinking about? Because I think this is where, like I, I can, I can best say for myself in terms of it's, it's been so hard to get where I've got to, in being able to say parking things to the side and not getting excited by certain things and really, um, I guess being a bit more patient with waiting for it to actually get there and um, doing things first before. Is there anything that you can share in terms of how you think about things that makes it easier for you to or make the right calls? I, I, look, I've, I've always been, you know, I, I guess I was fortunate from the very first day I started work, I, I joined a company where customer service was paramount. Uh, and that kind of, you know, I, I had managers that were just completely focused on the customer. And I, that really instilled in me a discipline around making sure that what we were doing as a business really does need to revolve around the customer. So a lot of the decisions that, that, that I make are about ensuring that, you know, we're, 
uh, we're improving the customer experience, that we're delivering better service um, to customers. So I, I just think you've got to be a customer driven organization. Even if I go back to the zero days, you know, um, I often said to the guys, it would be very easy for us as an organization to lose sight of the customer and become a bit arrogant. I saw it happen with, you know, I spent 15 years at Microsoft and Microsoft struggled through some cultural issues where you might recall back in the late nineties, you know, the, the Department of Justice was going to break up the company. Microsoft was accused of anti-competitive behavior. And they were saying, you know, that Microsoft's you know, an arrogant organization. Well, I saw it firsthand. I saw there was senior managers right up to the very top. Um, and don't get me wrong, Microsoft's a fantastic organization, but I think anyone who lived through that era would tell you that we were being, we were, we were an arrogant organization to deal with. And I learned a lot from that. And when I went to zero, I made sure I spoke to the guys all the time that, you know, when we became market leader in Australia, I said, look, we've still got to really listen and be absolutely attentive to what's going on with our customers because it'd be very easy for us to be arrogant. But you go back to that Microsoft example, this is very powerful. At the time when Microsoft was, Microsoft actually, you know, there was one point I remember in San Francisco in 1999 and the executive turned around and said, look, you know, we've, we've lost sight of the customer, we need to culturally change. And they embarked on this big customer, you know, satisfaction campaign where they're going to turn the culture around, make people more focused on the customer. That was about 1999. You think about some of the absolute behemoths of the industry that emerged during that window when Microsoft was focused on itself. You know, I'm talking Amazon, Google, Apple had a comeback, and then you've got um, Salesforce.com, the big competitors that really took ownership of different chunks of the market and just absolute behemoths today, all came to the fore at a time when Microsoft could have could have dominated those, those areas of the business. So I think it's a really powerful lesson in if you're not, you know, even on a small scale, I mean, obviously they're big, big examples, but even on a small scale, if you're not thinking daily about how you can improve what you're doing with customers, um, then, um, then, you know, you're going to be in trouble or potentially. So, so that's a big lesson on that. Well, well, that's a great segue into Troy and I don't know if he's um, there still, but uh, can my prosperity link to uh, x -Flare? And I know the answer to that already, but... Uh, <laughs> He's throwing it out there. So anyone out there that wants to hit, hit Chris between the eyes with a couple of my prosperity no, questions. I'll, uh, I'll answer that. In fact, you know, that's a really good question, um, uh, um, you know, about being able to deliver to the needs of the market because we just we recently went out on a roadshow back in um, June and July and the number one request as we went around, we spoke to about 1,100 accountants and planners. The number one request was when you get into great tax plan. So I'm pleased to say we're actually at the AFA event a few weeks ago up on the Gold Coast. We had X-Plan come and speak to us. And look, um, X-Plan are obviously a dominant player in the market. And over the probably the last 12 months, we know they've done a lot of work on their API. And they haven't been necessarily the easiest to work with on open APIs. And you know, I say that in full respect, but they've got a lot on their plate. But the nice thing that we had learned from X-Plan was um, they've had in the last uh, recent while, they've had about 189 requests from the market to integrate X-Plan into my prosperity. So the demand's not just coming from our partners, it's, it's coming from partners directly into X-Plan. So we're actually looking at the API now. Uh, we're optimistic that uh, with some work between now and Christmas, we should be able to have something in market um, early in the new year. So that's the current plan. So, so yes, it's in the pipeline. Uh, we've got some other really exciting announcements over the next couple of week about weeks regarding integrations. It's a big focus of ours now to bring in uh, a lot of the um, you know, the investment platforms directly into the platform. So, that, um, you know, we've got a team now focused on that. So you're going to start seeing a lot more activity there. Yeah, it's really exciting. I, I love a good integration, Chris. And um, yeah, the way you guys are looking at it, it it's awesome. And, and to hear x actually looking at integrating, that's, um, that's, that's quite refreshing. So uh, that's good stuff. Yeah, it's good. They, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. And we are sort of, we, we're getting up there with time. Chris, is there anything, any parting remarks around um, advisors out there running their businesses that, um, that you've seen um, that maybe you could share just uh, to wrap up? I think I always come back to this notion of having fun. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's days where you kind of, you know, you, you're buried and, and things are overwhelming. And I think, um, I think as much as possible, you've got to try and remind yourself why you, you sort of started something, whether you're a financial advisor or whether you're, you know, someone like me getting involved in tech. I mean, for me, you know, I just love the challenge of being able to create something that's, uh, that's valuable. And, uh, you know, uh, my, my sort of ambition, I guess, if you like, 
uh, which I've got to constantly remind myself of on, the, on those days when, when things do seem overwhelming is, um, you know, to create something that's really valuable in the market that people really respect and admire and that they want to, they want to use and it's helping them. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, I speak to a lot of financial advisors that, that might be buried in paperwork and other things, but ultimately they got into advice because they wanted to help people. They wanted to actually improve people's lives and actually see them prosper and thrive. And you hear great stories when, you know, you, you know when you meet great planners where they talk about, you know, a client that they've had for 30 years that they've really helped. And, you know, I, I know my advisors helped me out of some difficult challenges going back, you know, uh, in the past. And, 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 and I think most planners want to be able to have that legacy, that they want to look, be able to look at their clients and say, look, we just, you know, uh, we just really help them prosper in their, in their lives financially. Um, so I think, again, you've got to come back to your purpose and you've got to come back to what really motivates you and, and keep reminding yourself on that, you know, on those days when, when it, it can be, look, running a business can be a really hard slog. So um, you've got to make sure you get your team around you, you enjoy, enjoy what you're doing, have fun and, um, and, and, and stay true to your purpose. Love it, Chris. Well, I'm certainly been having fun having a chat to you and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. The, to the guys out there, um, We'll see you at the event in Sydney. Chris maybe might even make an appearance if he gets himself a ticket. I know he's a busy man, but um, especially with it being fintech. Um, and have a great rest of the week. So thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Thanks Adrian. Thanks to your listeners. It's been great uh, being on your show. Cheers.